I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sammy Sino, Amanda Silva, and Raj Shah Martinez. Enjoy. I want to thank Dr. Rodriguez for taking time out of his schedule to come and join us. Our first live interactive journal club ever. So we're going to talk about facial transplantation and where that fits in in plastic surgery and what's happening and how it's going to probably revolutionize what we do in everyday plastic surgery. We're going to be tweeting out a lot, and we're going to get questions from everybody, but we're going to take the first questions from you all. We'll take one or two questions from our moderators, Sammy, Raj, and, and Amanda, who've been fantastic as ambassadors. And again, Ed, thank you so much for taking time to join us. Dr. Rodriguez, when did you first start becoming interested in facial transplantation, and when did you start realizing that you would be able to perform this extensive operation with such great success that you had? I was a young faculty member at Johns Hopkins, and the first presentation I saw related to face transplantation was by Maria Simonov, where she essentially showed a transplant of a black rat to a white rat. And looking at the transplantation in a rodent model, I was quite impressed. My mentor at that time, Paul Manson, who had been treating facial injuries his entire life, thought that this would be a good field for me to develop. And I didn't really know the magnitude of what he was thinking about. But as I became much more interested in this problem, there were a lot of things that were happening along the time. We were in a war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and soldiers were being sent to us from Walter Reed and National Bethesda with really challenging problems. We were able to get some money through a grant from the Department of Defense, where we worked on a primate model, which has been published in the Journal of Plastic Surgery. And once we kind of moved along in that direction, identifying that we can actually perform these transplants on primates, the next evolution was to solve the human problem. And when we look at the history of facial transplantation and we look further on facial reconstruction, the quality of the results that we've achieved, even from the beginning when we first started treating facial injury in World War I, they weren't far different than what we were able to do. So looking back at the problem, the fact that we were involved in wars, and the fact that I was limited in what I can do with normal facial reconstruction allowed us to reach this point. I think we'd open it up to the audience. Does anyone have any burning questions? If not, we've got also a bunch from Twitter, so feel free. I just wanted to ask how important was the team and how many practice sessions did you undergo in preparation? Oh, I'm Dan Gould, fourth year resident at USC. But if you could just speak briefly about the team and preparation, and then also the sequence in the operating room, given that there's harvest of other organs. Thank you for that question. It ultimately comes down to the team, and I think preparation is what defines luck. You prepare as much as you possibly can, and you ensure that you look at every potential obstacle that could compromise. And I learned a great deal from being involved in the first face transplant in Maryland. And for that transplant, we did about 15 sequence rehearsals. And not only do you do it in a cadaver lab, you transfer that information. You practice cadaveric runs in a hospital with your nursing staff instrumentation. You have to think about the sequence of individuals, personnel that are going to be with you with a procedure that may be 24 to 36 hours. Now, once you have that element defined, the final element is to try to practice that type of an operation on a brain dead donor. And that's been published in the journal. And I think it's instrumental because we're doing something that had never been done before. And I think At the end of the day, what we do every day in our practice is is care for patients. This is everything that we do in our field is patient-driven. It's not ego-driven. And we have to ensure that this procedure will be reproducible. So we practice on a brain-dead donor. We only practice about 50% of the operation, the procurement of the face. Once we procure the face and I was able to find out that this could be done, now we're ready for the clinical operation. Now, having said that, when you perform the clinical transplant, You have to keep in mind, no different than football, when you're fourth and goal, you have to have the ability to call some audibles. Now, as a team, we rehearse what are the obstacles that are going to present themselves on that day. And also, beyond our patient, we have individuals that need life-saving organs. So this has to be a flawless procedure. Now, we practice, and that allows that to be the case. In New York, we have a different set of challenges and obstacles, identification of the donor, And I learned a great deal from the first operation. And with every operation, no different than plastic surgery, we treat our last complication. And we want to ensure that we deliver patient safety and maximal reliability. So I learned, I wouldn't call them mistakes, but some oversights that I had. And we refined them. 
and we were able to deliver that in New York. And we actually, although Patrick's case involved a lot more soft tissue and they were very different, I would say that his case was much more challenging because it involved the complete scalp and the back of the head and we were concerned about pressure. But we think about all these elements. And as a team, we go through an exercise process of brainstorming, detailing an algorithm, and what do we do if this happens? And I think that preparation allows us to be successful. We have a question. Nate Villanueva, UT Southwestern, fourth year plastic surgery resident. In terms of patient preparation, right, when you're getting them ready for the OR, what kind of education do they undergo in addition to their standard you're going to be on immunosuppression protocol? What other education in terms of the functional outcome, warnings, things to be aware of after the surgery do you prepare them for? That's an excellent question. And one thing that I try to define in this field, although there have been 38 transplants performed throughout the world, when a patient comes to me and I have to define an operation that I've never done, the most important is transparency. So I'm very clear with the patient. I've never performed this. And that's why I tell them you have a 50-50 chance of surviving this. And it's clear that they really understand that this could end their life and that they have to be willing to commit to this because we've not performed this and we don't know. And I think it's unfair to offer an optimal prediction of statistic of which I've never done before. So I let them know that they don't have to do this. And that's why I go with the 50-50. It's a coin toss. Now, having said that, we prepare as a team, as a unit, to be as precise as we possibly can. But the first level of commitment is to understand that we don't have enough information on our registry and as an organization to confirm that this can be done safely. We will try everything possible, but everything that we do is based on our routine practices. I give them the 50-50 chance, spend a lot of time with their family, and I have a team made up of clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, social worker. We do an on-field evaluation where we actually go to the patient's hometown. We do an assessment of pharmacy. Do they have the medications that they need? If they have an acute rejection episode, Can they get the medications to treat them as soon as we can get them up to New York? Do they have the right physician? Do they have the right pain specialist? There are a lot of psychosocial issues involved in these operations. So you need to make sure that they have the right support system. Keep in mind that in the transplant world, even patients that have a transplant are not compliant with their medication. Once a patient starts feeling well, they're going to be reluctant to take their medication precisely. So once we cross the line of transplantation, we don't know. But we try to vet as many of these problems as we possibly can. And even the medication, as I pointed out. But we really try to lower the expectation of success, make sure they truly understand. With that in mind, not only does the patient sign the consent, but we have a caregiver consent. And in Patrick's case, his brother and his sister were with him through the entire process. And they take that consent, they read it at home, that's a screening consent, and they sign the formal consent. And then we constantly revet that process every month that they come up. That's the best that we can do. It's not a guarantee, but it's, it's the most transparent and reliable process that we can provide. Thank you. Questions over here. Hi, Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Adrian. I'm from Singapore. I'm also the microsurgery fellow at UNC of Chicago. I have actually two questions. First thing is you perform the face transplants at two different locations now. What are the main obstacles to setting up the program and how did you overcome these obstacles? That's the first question. Second question is, obviously, as you mentioned, immunosuppression is a huge issue with these patients and compliance medication and all that. Where do you see the future of immunosuppression going with BCA? Thank you for the question. I'll tell you something that I'm really proud of, and although it was a challenge, and I think when we challenge ourselves and we overcome those challenges it allows us to be better. And something that I'm very proud of is coming to New York and starting with a whole new team. Once I had it all figured out, I had an opportunity that I could not refuse. To recreate that team, to tackle a difficult problem was very challenging. However, I had 100% buy-in from a remarkable core surgical team and then what it takes to make this happen. Nursing staff from the level of the dean, the CEO, the financial support from an institution. This, the grant created for this patient was provided through a grant from NYU Langone Medical Center. But once you have buy-in from the top and you have people that are committed emotionally and mentally to make this happen, and also you vet the process, not everyone can be part of this team. Because when the donor presents himself to do a face transplant, 
Everyone on this team has to be able to give up everything to be part of this. Once we have the donor, the world stops for us as we know it, and we got to commit because although this patient is brain dead, we have to ensure that these gifts from these patients are delivered and we deliver the wishes of this patient and their family. So it has to be 100% successful. The big challenge that I did not predict in New York, and all New Yorkers, now that I consider myself a New Yorker, we tend to be overconfident at times, but we can't be very confident of our consent to donation process. We are the last state in the country as far as donation of organs. So I took it upon myself to provide an opportunity for awareness and organ donation because there are numerous patients that die waiting for hearts, lungs, kidneys. And I thought it was a great opportunity for us as plastic surgeons in our society, not only to improve the quality of patients with facial injuries, but to raise awareness about organ donation and save more people's lives. That was a challenge. The other challenge was the transportation of a patient to our hospital. In New York, when I came, there was a big issue with the Department of Health because a patient had been transported from one institution to the other and the donor died in transit. And the responsibility that I was given to ensure success of his transport was that it had to be 100% successful. And that's why I put myself on the line and I personally transported the patient in the ambulance with the team to ensure that there was success of the transport, but also success of the seven or eight other people that received organs in that day. So these were the things that were unpredictable, but we were able to manage them, and we were fortunately successful, and I think this increases awareness. Thank you for the question. Chad Tevin from the University of Chicago. I'm wondering, there are ethical issues that arise every day in what we do. I'm wondering what some of the ethical issues are that are unique to this type of surgery, or maybe even highlighted by this type of surgery, and even thinking ahead moving forward if we end up doing this in pediatric patients as well some of the unique challenges and ethical dilemmas that may arise? A lot of what we do in plastic surgery, there's an ethical side to everything that we do. And it's a great question. One of the things that we perceived to be an ethical problem was the issue of identity. You have to understand when you have a member of a family that's donated the face of their child or loved one, you know, they're concerned that they would see them walking around the streets. But it hasn't been the case. And we were able to prove that not only with cadavers, but also in the two patients that I've done. When you look at these two individuals side by side, there are resemblances, but they're not the same people. I think the other bigger ethical concerns, these are quality of life transplants. These are not life-saving. And therefore, we have to be very careful. This is not for media attention. This is not ego-driven. This is primarily to care for patients. With regards to issues, as I see it, as limitations, I am not a strong supporter of a pediatric transplant. The reason for that, if you look at Isabel de Noir now, her transplant lived for 10 years. We're learning, and we're learning based on their experiences, things that they could have done better, but they've been very transparent with us, and we want to make sure that we can do this reliably. I don't think that it's appropriate just yet to perform a transplant on a child of which we don't know the long-term success. We have to be careful. Now, Scott Levin's case with a pediatric hand is a different story because that young child had a kidney. So I think it's appropriate to proceed in that manner. But for an individual that's not had a transplant, I would be very careful. I'm also very careful with blind patients. I commonly reconstruct blind patients when they have traumatic injuries. A blind patient that's dependent on visibility of the graft to see if there are any changes in rejection, I would want to be careful. We know that some blind people are highly independent. You see them walking with their service dogs. They can do groceries. They can manage their homes. We introduce another element. We might limit some of their independence. These are some of the ethical issues that we have to be careful. Funding is a big problem. Who's paying for this right now? Primarily the Department of Defense, research grants from multiple institutions. And also we have a lot of generous people that are donating money to this cause. But I think ultimately the immune suppression issue is going to resolve itself. There are a lot of smart people working on this. I don't believe that we as plastic surgeons are going to figure out immunology, but we're going to be part of the team that's going to help solve this problem. But we're going to be very steadfast, very committed, slow and methodical, and this will be in our field for the future. So, Ed, what's next in transplantation? I mean, these are amazing cases. 
I think more and more cases are going to be probably led by the United States. We have the resources, we have the backing, we have the support of the Department of Defense, we have support from Capitol Hill. I think more and more cases will come. And as we do more cases, we're going to understand the process a little bit better. Now, having said that, despite the fact that I support face transplantation and I perform these operations, if I'm doing these operations in 10 years, there's a problem. Because I think ultimately the goal is to develop technologies that will be better. And I think there are a lot of groups that are working on regenerative medicine to try to develop muscles, cartilage, bone. And if we can treat deformities better, it's a combination of these two elements. I think right now transplants leading the field. And they're going to work very aggressively on the reduction of the medication. I think that's a big element. And there are going to be some interesting measures on that side. And I even think with our last patient, the ability to perform this transplant without any episodes of acute rejection episodes have been very helpful. We're very selective on the donor criteria and selective on the donor matching, and that was helpful to us. Some of the mistakes that were made early on or some lack of oversight early on in the field that we didn't know what we were getting into, we've learned. And I think we're going to reduce a large number of these issues. But the field will continue to grow. Selective centers in the U.S. will likely be doing this, tied in with transplant programs. There's going to be governance issues, but it's exciting to be a part of all this. But the field will continue to grow, and ultimately... In 10 years, we'll be doing something better than this. Thank you for everyone who's been answering and asking questions on Twitter. We have a couple of fans of yours in the Middle East and South America, and some of the residents out there are wondering, what advice would you give to a young resident or fellow seeking to sort of follow in your footsteps, to develop this career? How should they prepare to either develop their own transplant program or prepare themselves to some training to get to where you are now? I first want to begin by letting all of you know this is something that wasn't in my trajectory of my planning of my future career. As a matter of fact, many of you don't know this, but I think it's helpful to understand that when I first began my career, I didn't know if I wanted to be a physician or a dentist. And I actually wasn't smart enough or good enough to get into medical school, so I chose to go to dental school. And that was a field that I just thought I wanted to be a professional and get back to my hometown of Miami, maybe have a yacht and have fun and make money like all of us. But as I pursued down this path, and something that I will tell all the individuals, the young people that I can help, is that don't give up your passion. A lot of us don't really know what that is, but I think we all develop a question in our mind, and and we want to pursue that answer. I decided to go on to oral and maxillofacial surgery, which I enjoyed, and I I think it's been a great field, and it's provided a lot of education and a lot of opportunity to do these face transplants potentially better in that field there were questions that remain, and I felt that I needed more training. I had an interest in doing more soft tissue, more osteotomies, and that's why I pursued medical school, finally got into that, went on to plastic surgery. And in plastic surgery, as an oral maxillofacial surgeon, I thought that I was going to be properly suited to deal with cleft lip and palate. And it seemed like a unique tie-in for me as a plastic surgeon I had a bigger interest in microsurgery and solving bigger problems, but I wasn't interested in just throwing a blob of tissue in the face. And I'm sorry that that sounds a little bit harsh, but I felt that we had to focus on the aesthetics of the patient. At the end of the day, everything that we do in this field has to look as best as it possibly can, whether you're a cosmetic surgeon or a reconstructive surgeon. There are two things that are uniformly acceptable and universally acceptable by people. They want to live as young and as healthy and as long as they possibly can. And we want to look as best as we possibly can within means. So if we were able to take that approach and transfer that to reconstructive surgery, that was very easy for me. Going to Changgung and coming back and being in a situation which is unfortunate, dealing with war victims, our soldiers in the U.S. from Iraq and Afghanistan, it was the perfect storm for us to figure out we had to push face transplantation for it. But there was no planned approach. I was persistent. It takes a tremendous amount of work, which all of you can do. It takes a tremendous amount of reading. It takes commitment on your part. I have a family. It's my wife and I, so I have to take care of my wife. I enjoy being with her. But it's how you organize your life to do the things that matter to you. And for me, my work experience plays a huge role in my life, and that provides a lot of fulfillment. So... That's a long-winded answer to maybe a relatively short question. 
Questions from the audience. Okay, my name is Shashank. I'm from India. My question was, what comments about head transplantation and transplantation during the notochord stage? I think it's quite incredible that that's being considered. The response that I'm about to give you is based on personal experience in face transplantation, of which we transfer peripheral sensory nerves and we transfer peripheral motor nerves. The main issue we're having in hand transplants and in face transplants is the return, the functional motor recovery. And that's why I find it very difficult. And when I've published about this to different media outlets, I find it very difficult to believe that you can transect a patient's head at the level of the cervical cord, and although you can unite it, I'm concerned about the distal recovery. Forget about the limbs. Forget about face. What about important organ function, like your heart and your lungs and your diaphragm? I'm not a strong believer in this could work. I think it's a wonderful idea, but I think we're not there yet. I don't think that this is something, this is far beyond experimental, and I just don't think it's possible. Our people thought what you did was not possible. Do we limit our imaginations to what is happening today? You never let your imaginations limit you. We eliminate imaginations by performing research. And for multiple years of performing primate transplants, we moved on to human experimental trials. There are limited experimental trials on total head transplant. And if you look at the literature very closely, the long-term results are very short-lived, at the bare minimum weeks, if not days, if not hours. So I think it's, it doesn't provide the appropriate foundation, and it's not right to treat our patients based on limited research discovery in that field. Next question. I'm Miguel Bravo from Madrid, Spain. What do you think about eye transplantation? As you said before about head transplantation, what do you think are the main challenges about the feasibility of uh, eye and orbital transplantation? Thank you. It's a wonderful question, and I think there may be a possibility of that. There have been some publications in the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery focusing on that, and they looked at some cadaveric exercises. I would like to see more large animal research. The optic nerve is a difficult nerve. It has many, many components, many cables. We have to ensure that beyond vision, can we get a person to blink? The connections within the orbit, the contents of bony socket, can we get normal movement of the extraocular muscles? The anastomosis, how are these going to be? We know we have optic vessels which are posterior close to the optic chiasm. Is this something that can be dependent on superficial system? And I think it's important that one of our major contributors in plastic surgeon, Bo Pomahawk, was the one that defined the vasculature of the face being supported by the facial artery and vein, and that's a remarkable accomplishment. But I'm not sure that that would be sufficient to support the autonomic nervous system with vision. I think we may be able to provide some protective vision, maybe 2,400, maybe some shadows. But I think it's an important field, and we should do more research in it. So we have another question from someone on Twitter who wanted to ask you, have you been experiencing any adverse psychological complications post-op, and if so, which, and how long before they are resolved? We haven't really experienced any major psychological issues with these patients, but I will tell you from my personal experience, the two patients that I've taken care of, which are no different than a patient that's had severe facial disfigurement and has lived with that disfigurement for a long time, there are psychological scars that do not get solved once you put a face transplant on someone. All of us at some point in our life have experienced some form of, whether it's an environment where we become insecure or maybe we're not the most liked person in a class. Those are limited moments in our life. But when you live with a facial disfigurement for the longest time, like 14 years, you're nervous to walk into a restaurant where people are going to see you. Although you see yourself as normal, we think they look normal. That's a process that takes time. Also, with the battlefield injury, with soldiers, with first responders, individuals that have traumatic facial injuries, there is an unfortunate dependence to pain medication that happens over time. 
And this is a universal problem, and I know something that we're trying to fix in the U.S. As physicians, although we want to help our patients, we are partially responsible for trying to solve pain and how do we define pain. So there are some pain issues that we try to manage. There are psychological issues. There haven't been any inadvertent consequences. Patients are very compliant with their medications. My two patients, we monitor them very carefully, and it's part of the contractual agreement to be part of this experimental research program. But these are things that we carefully watch. And if I look at my first patient, who's over five years out now, and I look at his first three years compared to the latter years, he does, he's in a much more stable situation now than he was early on. And there is arrested development when a patient has an injury. At that point, they're just focusing on survival, trying to live their life as best as they can, but they're hiding from society, and you lose those societal cues that we deal with on a daily basis of being employed, going to the grocery store, picking up your children from school. That kind of disappears. So we have to reinstate that and re-educate them. Thank you. Jordan Fry from NYU. Dr. Rodriguez, as you look forward to your third face transplant from your second with Patrick, what technical refinement or operative refinement are you most looking forward to or, or see in the future? Thank you, Jordan, for the question. The first technical refinement that I made from case one to case two, which actually saved us a lot of time. On the first case, I spent a lot of time dissecting V1, V2, and V3 on Richard, and I couldn't find any virgin tissue for coaptation. Although I placed V3 in proximity to the mandibular foramen, I was hoping something would happen. Now, V1 and V2, I couldn't find a target nerve. So I just decided to abort, and I just laid the nerves in proximity. What was interesting about Richard is that he actually recovered normal sensation, V1, V2, deficient in V3. So based on that, with Patrick's case, I did not spend time, although I include, you always include as much more tissue in the donor procurement. You just want to have more tissue and you can shape later. But we did not co-opt V1 or V2. What I did do was a portion of Patrick's mental nerve, although I kept his sensory branches to the mucosal lining of his lip, one of the accessory branches, I did a co-optation to the mental nerve of the donor face. That saved some time. The next modification that I did from case one to case two, I did not connect any motor nerves because Patrick's case, I felt, had normal mobility underneath that scar. That was more worthwhile to overlay the donor face over the facial musculature with his facial musculature moving the donor face. Most of the cases before Patrick's case, they did a coaptation of the nerve at the nerve trunk as it comes out the stylomastered paramen or distally in proximity to the target muscle units. However, I did not want to compromise his corneal blink, which I didn't do in, in Richard's case. I did not compromise that nerve. That's why I connected to the distal branches working your way down from buccal down to marginal mandibular. But in Patrick's case, I preserved all motor nerves, and sure enough, his face did move that face. So I think modifications in sensory nerves, modifications in motor nerves, and also inclusion of bony elements to support the soft tissue of the face. So if we have to support a forehead, which is something I should have done in Patrick's case, I would likely take components of the calvarium or the frontal bone to support the forehead to limit the amount of ptosis. So I think with every case, we keep modifying the technique. I just want to say, I think that's an important point. I know there are a lot of residents and fellows in the audience. I look, I get to work with Dr. Rodriguez all the time, and you see the results, and they're very good, but he's never satisfied. And even in such a challenging operation, he's always looking at ways to make it better. Just to that last point, he's doing cadaver dissections to try to get the brow just right the next time. So I think that's an important mentality for us to have, whatever we do, is that you can never really be satisfied. So that's something he teaches us as his residents, but that you should all take from this too. Sammy, I want to take the liberty to speak to all the, the residents and fellows and young faculty members that are here today and those that are listening, that you should never be satisfied with everything that you do. And I think when it comes down to taking care of patients, it's something that you should never compromise. Because if you look at every result, whether it's a radiological result, a CT scan of your facial trauma, the result of your aesthetic case, if you look at it carefully, 
you will always find something that you should improve. And I never ask anything of my residents that I don't ask of myself. And if you look at that carefully, it's going to raise questions. It's going to make you think about what you're doing. And it's going to allow you, it's going to provide that stepping stone for improvement. It also preserves humility. In this field, in this work that we do, there's a lot of opportunity to become arrogant. I have an ego. We all have egos. But if we keep that in check, it allows us to move forward, care for our patients, and allows us to advance this field. Hi, Dr. Rodriguez. Joshua David from New York. I had a question, something that came up in the panel discussion that you were in last night regarding the difficulty of choosing these patients for these operations in terms of the recipients. And I was wondering if you could discuss a little bit about the current process for how these recipients and the patient's selection is optimized and patient outreach is performed, whether you believe this is uh, adequate and how to optimize this moving forward as this procedure becomes more integrated into plastic surgery. Thank you. Patient selection is of the utmost importance, whether it's a recipient or donor selection, it's the same. The same degree of obsessive compulsive behavior to manage that, it's the same for both. And when you look at the recipient, I initially vet the recipients. I have an understanding of the, the recipient that has a anatomical deformity that cannot be treated with conventional surgery. And I also look at the number of procedures that they've done. Based on that, I begin to detail the operation, and I also look for psychological awareness and community as well as familial support because this is something that you can't go through by yourself. If you don't have those elements, you're likely not going to be a patient. The other important element is that all these patients require some form of insurance coverage because we provide the grant for the pre-hospital care, the hospital care, and 90 days after the surgical procedure. That's about 90 days of coverage. And if we look at the support at NYU, is approximately a million dollars for that kind of care. But we can't be responsible for the medicinal care after that. We have to ensure that there will be a third-party payer that will provide support of the medications or potential complications that may arise. And we think that's only appropriate and fair for our patients to understand that. But we do help them with the process. We communicate with their medical insurance companies, and we confirm this. Everything occurs in writing before we actually commit to these types of patients. But there are a lot of elements involved. Once we feel, and I feel that this is a patient that we can consider, then it gets vetted through a large group. And I also vet that patient with a number of individuals that are going to challenge me. I'm not an individual that's going to surround myself with people that want to agree with me. I want to be tested, and I need to ensure that I'm making the right decision. And I also give these patients the opportunities to see experts throughout the nation to ensure that this is the right approach for them. On behalf of PRS, PRS Go, us as resident ambassadors, we want to thank Dr. Rodriguez so much. Obviously, cutting-edge contributions. We encourage you all to read, continue reading the PRS Journal, listen to the podcast, engage with us on social media with the journal clubs. Hopefully, this is just the beginning of engagement with authors and our leading-edge contributors, and we'll see you online. Thank you very much.